okay, I need some answers and I've made the decision. I'm going to get my child evaluated. What does that even look like? What should it include? Ah, where do I even start? I'm Jenny Sherson, ex-special educator turned dyslexia interventionist. It wasn't so long ago that I too was overwhelmed by balanced literacy versus structured literacy, education speak, and everything in between. Fast forward after many, many hours of self-driven education, and you'll see I've built a thriving dyslexia practice helping students from age 6 to 18. My specialties? Working with the quote-unquote difficult, almost always to be, student, and breaking down the complexities of dyslexia into everyday language strategies and action steps. You've come to this point. You know your child is struggling with reading. You suspect dyslexia, and you've decided you need to get your child assessed. But now that you've made the decision, you realize you don't actually know what an evaluation looks like or should include. Last episode, we talked about how to get an evaluation and who should be doing the evaluation. Today, we're going to delve into what exactly a good evaluation should include. Before we get in too deep, I want to take a few minutes to talk about the difference between a dyslexic screening and a diagnostic evaluation. Screenings are made up of short tasks that focus on key reading skills, phonological awareness, letter sound knowledge, reading fluency, etc. Common screeners used in schools are the Dipples, the Ames Web, and the Shayowitz Dyslexia Screener. The primary focus of a screening is to find and identify students who show they are struggling with foundational reading skills or maybe in the future. These students are considered at risk. If your child's scores show they need some extra or intensive support, the school should begin the process of placing your child into a tier two instructional program. A screener does not lead to a diagnosis for your child. For that, you need a diagnostic evaluation. Diagnostic evaluations are individually administered and look specifically for your child's strengths and weaknesses and how greatly their skills differ from their peers. Diagnostic evaluations are also used to drive instruction. In other words, they help determine what type of instruction or intervention your child requires. The assessments neuropsychologists, school psychologists, and other trained professionals typically administer during an evaluation are norm reference standardized measures. A norm reference assessment uses an individual scores to compare their performance to that of their peers. Is the individual scores on par with their peers, or are there any anomalies? And if so, where? It's important to note there is no one assessment for diagnosing dyslexia. Instead, an evaluator uses several different measures to make their final diagnosis. Some of the most commonly used assessments are the CTOP2, the PAT2, the Wyatt4, the Woodcock-Johnson4, the KEDA3, the GORT5, and the FAR. So, what should a good overall evaluation include? It should start with a thorough review of all current medical, developmental, and educational records. What are the events that led to your child sitting in front of the evaluator? Medically, the evaluator also wants to rule out any hearing or vision problems. Dyslexia is neither of these. The evaluator also needs to know if the school has tried any interventions with your child and which ones. Prior interventions can influence how a child approaches a task or responds to a question. An experienced evaluator can quickly pick this up and will note the effectiveness of the intervention in their final report. Was the child able to complete a task because they received intervention services or were the intervention services lacking? When I have a student in front of me who has received intervention services, they are solid in their responses up to a point and then they hit a wall. The wall usually appears right at the same point they are at in the intervention or where they stopped receiving services. It's usually a very clear line. 
Next, the evaluator needs to know if someone else in the family struggles to read or has dyslexia. This includes grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, etc. It does not have to be in the nuclear family unit. Dyslexia is genetic and runs through families. All three living generations of my family have at least one dyslexic. The evaluator needs to have this information and take it into consideration when analyzing your child's results. Okay, now we're down to the assessments. What skills should the actual assessments test? First, the evaluator needs to look at phonological processing. Phonological processing covers three areas. Phonological awareness, the ability to recognize and play with sounds. Rapid automatized naming, the ability to quickly retrieve words and names. And phonological working memory, the ability to hold the sounds in memory long enough to put all the pieces together. Next, the evaluation needs to include single word and nonsense word reading subtests. These subtests should be timed and untimed. As an interventionist, I am most interested in the nonsense word reading subtests. The scores from this test can show me if a child is truly able to decode or is really relying on their memory when asked to read. The next two pieces an evaluation should include are fluency and comprehension subtests. These two skills are closely tied together. If you read slowly, there is a very high chance by the time you get to the end of the sentence, you won't remember the words at the beginning of the sentence. Fluency and comprehension can be tested together. However, comprehension should always be assessed with a passage followed by comprehension questions so that the evaluator knows you really did understand what you just read. A complete diagnostic evaluation should also include subtests related to oral language skills, vocabulary, listening comprehension, oral expression, etc., spelling, and written expression. An examiner wants to be able to compare oral expression skills with written expression skills. By doing this, they can see if your child has an overall language expressive issue or if it's just isolated to writing. Outside of reading and language skills, a diagnostic evaluation should also test for skills in mathematics. Students with dyslexia often struggle with basic math facts. Finally, a well-rounded evaluation should include an IQ assessment. An IQ assessment is not required to diagnose dyslexia, but they can be really useful, especially the subtests around working memory, processing speeds, long-term retrieval, and fluid reasoning. So let's recap. Your child can be screened for a suspected reading disability, but a screener is not a diagnostic tool. A diagnostic evaluation looks for your child's individual strengths and weaknesses and should include the following. Analysis of the child's full medical, educational, and family history, all three components of the phonological processing, word reading, both real and nonsense, fluency and comprehension subtests, oral and written language subtests, mathematics, and finally, a full IQ assessment. As you can see, a full evaluation is quite comprehensive and should provide many insights into how your child takes in, processes, and then outputs different forms of information. Now you have a better understanding of what your child's evaluation should include, but what should you do after you get the diagnosis and final report? In our next regular episode, we'll look at what to do once you've received your child's official dyslexia diagnosis. Our very next episode, in honor of October being Dyslexia Awareness Month, we're stepping out and celebrating the dyslexics in our life. So come paint the town silver with us. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Literacy Untangled. If you loved this episode as much as I did, head on over and rate and subscribe so you never miss an episode. If you want to continue the conversation or share your takeaways, head on over to our Instagram at Literacy Untangled and comment on your favorite part. I can't wait to hang out with you again soon. Bye.